are needing God to not just protect us, but to give us direction as we go the way he wants us to go. Last year, you guys remember, uh, Pastor Mon and myself, we went to Israel and we had a second leg of the trip that I guess out of 300 plus people, 200 of us decided to take the second leg as well and extend it and go to Egypt. You figure if you're in Israel, how often are you going to be near Egypt? You might as well go for it. <laughs> so that's what we did. And, um, and so we got there and, you know, we, they had already given us, you know, had all these meetings before we went, Zoom meetings and going over the itinerary, sending out paperwork, all that kind of stuff. And so how many of you know I didn't read most of my paperwork until I got there? So I'm sitting inside the hotel, we multiple hotels, but the first hotel sitting inside the hotel, and I'm reading it and reading it. And then I get to say, okay, I went through everything for Israel. Now let me just look at what they're saying about going to Egypt. And they said, um, notice the U.S. State Department says do not travel from Israel to Egypt going through the Sinai Peninsula, terrorist, extreme terrorist threat. I said, I need protection. They ain't ready to... <laughs> I said, what? I had to reread that. I said, that might be jet lag still. So I went back and reread it. Then I went on Wikipedia and I read that. I said, oh, this is, this is real. I said, did you read this? <laughs> and at that point, I had two options. I could obviously go home with the other group that didn't go, or we could stay and go forward with it. Well, there was no way I was going to waste that kind of money and not go. And I laugh about it because when we think about danger and we think about needing God's protection, even though in that situation, if I wanted to, we could have gotten out of it. It wouldn't have been a big deal, right? But what I, what I need to understand is that sometimes we go through dangers on our journey that aren't optional. In other words, in the society that we live in today, in 2023, it's not optional if you participate in society if you're going to be in danger at times. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me this morning. And we live in a society where mass shootings have become commonplace. It ain't optional on our journey. Y'all ain't going to say nothing this morning. We live in a society where our, our children and our loved ones go to school and maybe the target of cyberbullying. That's not optional in a society. We live in a society where home invasions, are, we're so used to hearing it, it doesn't even shake us anymore when we hear it on the news because it's no longer optional. And one of the greatest threats we have right here in this city is Atlanta drivers. I need protection. I need protection. Hmm. And we all want to get to where we're going to and be able to look back and say, man, we made it. We made it safe. Everything worked out. Got there without any issue. The thing about it is we don't know that until we get to the end of the journey how it actually turns out. We can say we want it to turn out a certain way. We can say we hope it turns out a certain way. But we don't know if it actually turns out a certain way until after we make our journey. Y'all ain't going to say nothing this morning. And, and, and regardless of whether, uh, and, and the truth of the matter is, you're probably not going to go through a journey where you're traveling through the Sinai Peninsula, right? And maybe you're not going back to school. But every one of us in here is going from some place to from where we are now to where we hope to be. Some of you, you're going through a journey right now, and it's in your career. And you're going from where you are, and your hope is to climb the corporate ladder to where you are. Hope to be. Other of us, we're going through a journey in our health, and, and the goal is, God, I, I may have sickness now, but I'm taking a journey and a step, trusting you that I'm moving towards what? Wellness. Some of us, your journey is dealing with your finances. You're saying, God, I, I'm, I'm asking you to get me out of debt. Help me. I done made a mess. I want to get out of debt. I want financial freedom. And so you're moving now from, from being in debt to being debt-free. All of us are on a journey of some sorts. And no matter what journey you're on, you don't know how it turns out until the journey's over, which is why it's a faith walk. Amen. Which is why you need faith this morning. And I want to just kind of show you some folks in the scripture, which I thought was, was pretty cool, that are in the same place that many of us are in. They had to walk through the dangers of what was happening, and there was a concern not just for themselves, but they were concerned about the safety of their children. And we can learn three things that we can apply for ourselves this morning. I'm going to be brief this morning if y'all pray with me. Now, I really wanted to be brief because after church, there's a food truck outside for y'all, so I wanted to be brief. <laughs> They're like, all right, heaven preach. 
If you look in the book of Ezra, chapter 8, verse 21 through 23, I'm going to read it. It says, There by the Havana Canal I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for what? A safe journey. For us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road. Because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his anger is against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. <clears throat> I want you to, <clears throat> excuse me, consider where we are in Ezra's story. Ezra <clears throat> is writing about a time when you remember, and I always like to use the analogy of time out, Israel disobeyed God, and God said, okay, cool, this is the land we agreed on. You, the land, and me, the three of us are in a covenant. As long as you do my will, we're going to all be connected. But when you get outside of my will and do life your way, you're going to be exiled because you have broken the covenant. So since you've broken the covenant, y'all know how we are. You can't live up in my house. So he sends them away and lets them go into Babylonian exile. And he promises, and all of us know the scripture if you've been in church for half a second, he promises them at the beginning, before they even go, that he says, for I know the plans that I have for you and the thoughts that I think towards you to give you a hope and give you an expected end, not to harm you. He's telling them, you're going to go into to time out, but when it's all over, I still have a, a plan for you. I'm going to bring you back into the land of Israel, back into the promised land. And so Israel goes through their 70 years of Babylonian exile, and then the first exiles return back to Israel, and now, under Zerubbabel, and then now, this is again 80 years after the first exiles go back, here comes Ezra with a journey in front of him to take another group of people back to Israel. The reason why they're going back to Israel is, one, the exile is over, but two, they're going back to get their life back. They, that's where their life was. It was never supposed to be in Babylon. It was supposed to be back in the land of Israel. So they're going to rebuild the temple that was destroyed and rebuild their broken lives. And it's interesting because to really appreciate the story, you have to appreciate the fact that Ezra is almost like what we would consider to a secretary of state. Ezra's got a lot of power. Now he's, without getting into too much of the details, they went into Babylonian exile, but the Persians beat the Babylonians, so now they're under the Persians. Are you with me? Okay. So, so Ezra, though, he represents, if you will, uh, Secretary of State of the Affairs of Israel. So he's representing Israel's affairs while they're now in what would be considered Persia. And, and as, as a leader over Israel, he's got so much power that if he sees a Jew break the Torah, break the commands of God, he could have them punished. He has so much power that the scripture tells us in authority that he could go and request funds of the treasury from Persia. He had so much authority and power. And so now he's rising up to use what he has to take 1,500 Levites back to the land of Israel. But here is the interesting thing. Because despite all that he has, power, influence, uh, uh, access, all those things, he still faced enemies on the road. Now, let me say that again. Because see, sometimes on your journey, you deal with enemies that I don't care how much money you have, how much power you have, how many Facebook friends you have, it's not enough to deal with the enemies on the road. And so the scripture says that he wanted a safe journey, but he was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect them from enemies on the road. Now, for them, they had native uh, Arabs, they're called Bedouins, they, I didn't even realize when we saw them when we were there, that that group had been there for thousands of years. The same people that we would see on the side of the road that were friendly towards us would have been hostile towards ancient Israel. And so, he knew taking watch. It says one thing, and, and the brothers know what I'm talking about. It's one thing when you got to deal with a fight, and it's just you. It's another thing when you got to protect your wife and your children. Come on, somebody. 
And so you have Ezra and 1,500 men plus women and children, over 5,000 people traveling 900 miles by caravan with the threat of being raided, with the threat of their wives being taken captive and hostage, with the threat of being raped, with the threat of being killed. And, the, and it says, the scripture says, I wanted to ask the king, I wanted to ask the king for a military guard, but I was ashamed. Now, this is real interesting to me because, one, in that time, in a position that he had, he could have had a military escort escort him. When we were in, in Israel and we were going, crossing into Egypt and going across the Sinai Peninsula, we went, there was four buses, four coach buses, and we had military escort in front of the front bus, two on the side, and one behind us. That was 2022. And when I say they traveled, they traveled from the very beginning of that part of Egypt until we got to Cairo. Cairo was fine. It's like being in New York. But until we got through that part, they traveled. And Ezra says, I could have asked the king for military escorts. As a matter of fact, the only safe thing to do with 1,500 men and their wives and their little children and all their possessions, and watch this, the millions of dollars, the millions of dollars worth of gold and silver that we're carrying back to rebuild the temple with. The only sane thing to do would have been to ask the king. And he would have given him his request to ask the king for protection. But he writes it, he says, but I couldn't. Ain't that something? The question is, why couldn't Ezra ask the king for protection? He says, because I already told the king. Can y'all turn this monitor down or these monitors down just a bit for me, please? I've already told the king that the gracious hand is upon all of those who look to him. Hand of God is upon all of those who look to him. He, he, if you will, he gave him a testimony. He began to say, you know, I've read about how Moses, because you know the Persians wouldn't have known all of that, but I've read about how Moses, my ancestors, how, how when Pharaoh chased them, God parted the Red Sea and he gave them protection. I read about how they wandered around the wilderness and God sustained them and provided for them and the power of God moved on their behalf that nothing came against them to take them out. I read about how the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob kept Israel and got them into the land of Israel. He says, I'd already given my testimony. I'd already proclaimed what God could do. If I went back now and asked the king, my profession would not match my practice. Amen. Oh, my God. I don't know if you caught that. He said, I proclaim that God is able. I proclaim that God is a healer. I proclaim that God is a provider. I proclaim that God is a sustainer. I proclaim that God is a deliverer. To go back now and say, my practice doesn't match my proclamation. How many times on our journey, saints, do we proclaim one thing about God? We proclaim it in church, but our practice doesn't match our proclamation when the rubber meets the road. Oh, y'all ain't going to say nothing to me this morning. Come on, somebody. We proclaim that, that my God should supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. But then we practice worrying when we get home. Oh, God. We proclaim not by might, by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. But then we try to do it in our own strength on Wednesday. Come on, I wish I had just one winner. We proclaim that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. But we try to make ends meet all by ourselves in practice. We proclaim Psalm 91, past the morning, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and that no pestilence will come nigh our dwelling, and a thousand will fall on our left hand, and ten thousand at our right hand. We proclaim that, but in practice, during COVID, we have more faith in the mass than we did in our maker. Just say, ouch. He said, I would have asked the king, 
But I was ashamed because I knew in my heart what I had already testified. I knew in my heart what I said about my God. See, this is, the, this is why, you know, you can start off on somebody else's testimony, but you can't stay on somebody else's testimony. You can start talking about what God did for grandma and mama and my sister and my, but God said, no, no, I got to give you a testimony. So it's not just something that you talk about. It's something that you walk through about. It's not something you think you know. It's something that you really know. It's easy for us to say we believe God. All of us, myself included, that's easy. It's easy to say it. It's easy to say, he that keepeth Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. But it's hard to practice that when we send our kids to school and not worry. It's easy to say, I trust God, I trust God. You do? Okay. Yeah. I'll keep working. It's easy to say all that, but it's a whole nother thing to actually practice it. Come on, somebody. When we were, you heard it's 35 years, but I'm still amazed at how faithful God has been in our journey. I remember at 18 and 19, folks would say, well, what do y'all get married so early for? We just knew beyond the fact that we loved each other, we just knew that that was the will of God for us. Right. And that it wasn't going to be easy. We already knew that part. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. We already knew we had a hard road ahead of us. We knew we were both in college and we would have to figure out how to make it through college and, and not give up and all that kind of stuff. And um, so one day my father says to me, he said, I'm looking at a house. He said, I'm looking at a house and, you know, him and my stepmom were going to buy their first, first home together in Queens. And um, I said, oh, that's nice. And, and, and he said, and I'm going to get this particular house because it has an apartment in it so that you and Mona can live in it when y'all get married. So I said, oh, that's nice. And then I said, I don't see, to myself, I don't see us living together. I just didn't, that we weren't ready for that yet. I said, but it ain't no big deal because he's probably not going to follow through and do what he said he was going to do anyway, so that's not a big deal. That was January. By March, I get a phone call. I got the house. I said, oh, God. <laughs> Remember? I was like, he did it. Oh, my God. So then I felt this immense amount of pressure. It's like he got that house in my stepmom's first house ever so that me and the bride that I will marry that August can live rent-free downstairs. I said, that is, I like the rent-free part. <laughs> I did. But I knew it was not going to be a good mix. So we talked about it, we prayed about it, and we knew that's, that, was not, that was not God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, so we went to my father, went to his apartment, because he hadn't moved out yet, and uh, we sat down. He was not one that really liked to hear no. And so I said, well, you know, Dad, we really appreciate it, but we're not going to take the apartment. He said, come here. Sit down. So we sat at his kitchen table. We're going to do a budget. I said, okay. He said, write down how much you make. And look, y'all, I won't even bother telling you. It was so sad and sorry. <laughs> it was sad. So he put that on one side. He said, now write down all your expenses that you'll have. And he said, did you think about that? Well, no, I didn't think about that. Did you put that? No, what about tuition? Well, I didn't put that. And so he did this whole budget. He said, the way it looks to me, <laughs> <laughs> that you can't live without living in this free apartment. You won't make it. He says, so I'm going to give you seven days. You hear this urgency and this push. I'm going to give you seven days a week, he said, for you to reconsider. So we left out there. I said, boy, we talked. I said, that really did look bad, didn't it? <laughs> and she said, oh, it looks really bad. I said, well, you know, let's go back and pray about it again. 
I said, you know, maybe, maybe the Lord missed something when we prayed about it the first time. <laughs> this is for real. So we went back and prayed about it again, and, and we got this half a release. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It was, it was a half a release. It was like, it's clear as that you can do that if you want to. But you know how when your parents say that to you, but they're like, don't do it. That's how we knew in the spirit. So we said, all right, we're going to go back and take it. Well, we, we said we were going to take it, and it didn't take any time, uh, even you know, well before we got married, to realize it would be a disaster for us to have lived together. Somebody shout disaster. disaster. When I finally got it, I said, oh, God, now I got to go back again and tell them I'm not taking it again. So we, yeah, it was just pitiful. So we finally went back and told them that we weren't going to take the apartment. And I realized during that period, God was allowing me to be tested in the thing that I proclaimed. We had proclaimed, when folks would ask us, how are you going to do it? That was the first question. Are you getting married? How? And we always said, God will provide. God's going to take care of us. God's going to keep us. God's, gonna, God's already got this worked out. We were proclaiming one thing, but when I went back on it, I began to practice something else. And so God wanted to do something in us. And so the long story short was we wind up actually staying at Pastor Mona's mom's house upstairs for a few years. And then about two years before we moved down here, exactly two years before we moved down here, she had an apartment downstairs that she had built out. And she had an apartment. And the person that was in the apartment actually was a friend of ours, moved out. And when she moved out, the apartment became available. And we said, we want that apartment. And she said, well, I'm getting $600 a month for that apartment. I said, good God almighty because we were still in college, <laughs> just finishing. And so, and so we said, all right, well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pay it. Can I tell you what God did? We didn't know two years after that we were going to be living in Atlanta. We had never purchased anything like that before a home or anything else. We go, got down here, and we looked at getting this house, and you know what they wanted from us? Two years' history of renting. And so what God did for us is he said, I got you on a cross. I'm going to show you that I am your provider. I'm going to do stuff for you that you can't even see. I'm going to put you in a position that when it's time for me to call you out of New York and bring you down to Atlanta, Georgia, that you will have the rental history you need to get into the house. Because what I found out along the way is this. That man's inability is God's opportunity. When you can't do it, God will work it out. When you don't have the ability, God will. When the bank doesn't give you enough, God will work it out. When your job doesn't cover the God has the ability. When you have inability, God has all the capability to move on your behalf. Your inability is God's opportunity. He said. I was ashamed to ask the king, and let me just say this about shame real quick, because this is what happens, right? Whenever we see a gap between the way we are and the way we should be, the way we show up and the way we should show up, the emotion that comes off in the shame, anybody understand what I'm talking about? And he said, I was ashamed, so I didn't ask. Ezra was saying, I wanted to ask so bad, but I saw my own heart. And my community knew too because they all knew that I wanted to ask. All those 1,500 men knew I wanted to ask. He said, I was ashamed at how I showed up. I was ashamed because I missed the mark. I was ashamed because I trusted in me. I was ashamed because I disobeyed God. Many times shame will come. But can I just tell you something on the side right quick? When shame comes to you, and I was reading a little, little bit about shame this week in preparation. Shame is what they call a necessary negative emotion. In other words, these are secular writers. They, they say that shame will cause shame becomes a compass for you to let you know when you're not going the right direction. But here's the thing: what we see with Ezra, see what Ezra did is he allowed shame to drive him back toward God. What the enemy wants to do is let shame drive you away from God. Because I don't feel good enough, so I'm going to stay away from God. I don't feel worthy enough, so I'm not going to go to God in prayer. I don't feel righteous enough, so I'm not going to ask God. I've missed the mark, so I'm not deserving enough. God doesn't want you to allow shame to keep you from him. Let it drive you back to him. 
Shame is not supposed to be a long-term emotion that you carry for years. If it comes on, it's supposed to be a little warning light on your dashboard. Turn back to the Lord. It's not permanent. If you're carrying permanent guilt and shame, can I say this to you? It's not God's will. It's not God's will. So Ezra said, I, 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 I felt ashamed, but instead of running from God, I turned back to God. And, and so he goes back to God and he begins to call for a fast. He, he considers the fact that I'm responsible for over 5,000 people. And if they don't make it to their destination, their families, that's on me. And I know that there's enemies on the road. And, and I know that things seem hard. And, and I know that I'm dealing with a situation that's beyond my control and beyond my own power. So I've got to turn to fasting and prayer. Why does he turn to fasting and prayer? Because fasting and prayer are both the language of dependency. It is no longer me depending on what I can do for myself. It is me depending on only what God can do for me. What he's saying is I'm not going to rely on the fact that I have a lot of clout. I'm not relying on the fact that I have a lot of authority in Israel. I'm not relying on the fact that I have access to the king. I'm not relying on the fact that I have millions, literally millions of gold and silver. He says, but I'm relying on the fact that what I cannot do for myself, only God can do. And so what God will allow in your life is enemies on your journey to remind you that you can't trust in you. You can't trust in people. You can't trust in possessions. You can't trust in things. You can only put your trust in God alone. So when there's a gap in our lives between what we profess and what we practice, God allows these enemies to close the gap. Oh, you missed that. Because they, they make us practice, or they help us to practice trusting God. He begins to pray. And in the original language, it reads more like this. His prayer is more simply put like this. Make our way straight. That's a powerful prayer. Make our way straight. You may have heard it this way when it's referenced the same way in the Hebrew in a different place. It's make a straight way. Make, make straight his paths in the desert for Jesus in Isaiah and in the Gospels. And what that's actually saying is make a direct road that we don't have to turn aside because of enemies. Make a level, level road without obstacles. So what that could look like for you is that you pray, God, make my way straight. That when I start school in the first year, I don't have to deviate. I can finish in four years. God, make my way straight that when I'm beginning to pay off my bills, that I don't get an unexpected expense that takes me off my journey. God, make my way straight that when I start the treatment that the doctor gives, that it doesn't set me back, but it sets me up to go towards wellness. God, make my way straight because, see, the difference between a good trip and a bad trip is when your way isn't straight. I have a friend, he always prays, he got it from his mentor, he always prays, Lord, make our journey, when he's in the car, playing, whatever, make my journey uneventful. Don't allow anything unnecessary to come in my journey to make it something that it doesn't need to be. When he's saying, make our way straight, he's saying essentially, how many of y'all, the expression says, I'm, I'm going to make a beeline, it means a direct line from here to there, without anything obstructing my way. How many want God to make their way straight? That wherever you are on your journey right now, wherever you are emotionally, that God makes your way straight. Wherever you are financially, that God makes your way straight. That wherever you are in your relationship, that God makes your way straight. Wherever you are in your business and growing, that God makes your way straight. God will use enemies in your life to drive you to prayer so that he can answer your prayer, which is God make my way straight. So don't be dismayed, don't be dismayed with the enemies around you. Start thanking God for your enemies. Start thanking God for haters. Start thanking God for things that come in your way because it drives you back to trusting God so God can make your way straight. He wants to make your way straight. And then he says the final thing, and I'm almost done. Oh, yeah, I must want that food truck. Um, <laughs> 
He says, this is the part I like. Verse 23 said, we fasted and prayed and petitioned our God about this. And he answered our prayer. I like that. He says, we fasted and petitioned because we had enemies and because we know that God can do what he said he will do. We fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. That's powerful because, see, the funny part about it is when you go to the next part in Ezra, it's not that they're already there. He's just now getting everybody lined up to go. Which means that after he fasted and prayed, he knew he already had the answer before he even took a step. That's powerful. See, I started off saying you don't really know how it turns out till you get to the end. But once you've sought the hand of God, and once God has answered, moved on your behalf, you can step out of prayer and know that we had our prayer answered. Know that he heard our petition. Know that God is moving on your behalf. You can know it before you, can know it before you even walk it out. There's something in your knower that when you connect to God and you fasted and prayed and put your trust in him and that your practice and your proclamation are aligned, that you can walk with courage, you can walk with confidence, you can walk without doubt on the path that he's called you to, knowing that he already answered your prayer. So you're not walking out to see if you have victory. You're walking in a place from victory. I'm not trying to figure out if it works out in the 2023-2024 school year. I'm walking from the point of view it's already worked out. I'm not trying to see if my marriage works out. I'm walking from the point of view it's already worked out. I'm not trying to see if I can make ends meet. I'm walking from the place I know the ends have already met. It's already done. You get victory as your proclamation and your practice match each other. Oh, I like that. Hallelujah. It doesn't come as you're on the journey. It comes as your practice and your profession. Ah, begin to line up. Why you pray so much? Because I'm practicing for victory. Why are you still fasting? Because I'm practicing for victory. Why do you still give? Because I'm practicing for victory. Why you still serve? Because I'm practicing for victory. Why you go to church? Because I'm practicing for victory. I'm not trying to figure it out. I'm practicing what God's already going to do. My God. And as you practice what you profess, your inability becomes God's possibility, opportunity. God's opportunity. I want to pray with you this morning. Y'all come on up. I'm done. I want us, my prayer this morning, is sort of like James says that faith without works is dead. So what he's saying is profession without practice doesn't get you results. And I think in the church, in modern times, we have overemphasized profession and underemphasized practice. Oh, I'm going to say that again. In the modern church, this is more new in the last, I don't know, 20, 50 years, we have overemphasized profession. You hear people people say, um, don't say that. Like, don't say you're sick. But my stomach hurts, which you want me to say I'm sick. Don't say that. So we overemphasize profession, but we underemphasize practice. So you might correct me for what you would call a bad profession, but you won't correct me for eating bad. Practice. Because the church is so focused on profession, what we say, that we stop focusing on what we do. But with victory has come from historically, is when your profession and your practice align. Victory didn't come from Daniel just by Daniel saying he was going to have victory. Victory came from Daniel because Daniel practiced it by praying three times a day. Victory didn't come from Esther because she professed she was going to have the, we got the victory, we got it, we got it. She said, hold up. 
turn my plate down. I'm going on a fast for three days. And she said, if I perish, let me perish because I'm going to see the king because she moved from a place of victory knowing that before she got there, it was already done because she practiced what she proclaimed when she turned her face down to the wall. The devil professes that there is a God according to James. He says, Satan believes that there's a God and even trembles, but you won't see him walking in spiritual disciplines. If you're going to have victory in your life as a believer, what God is saying is we got to put more fo- less focus on our profession and more focus on our practice because when we can align those, heaven starts to move. Heaven begins to come down. Things begin to happen. Miracles take place. Bodies are healed. Deliverance happens. Ways are made out of nowhere. Mountains are moved. When we put our practice behind our profession, God himself shows up and he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so my prayer for all of us is that today is a day of recommitment. Watch this, the spiritual practices. That is no longer just what I talk about. Because, you know, I think we do a great job in general as as a church universal talking about prayer. I don't know how good of a job we actually do doing it. I think we have do a great job of actually saying we believe God, but I'm not sure that we do a great job of actually believing God. I want us to recommit our hearts this morning to truly practicing the things that we proclaim. We do a lot of pro- proclaiming on Sunday mornings. From every song that we sing has proclamations in it about I trust you and how great is our God and, and no weapon for him. We, do, we sing and say those things, and God says, I want to show you that. No, no, he says, you're singing about it, but I want to show you that. I want that to be real in your life. When we started off and we were engaged and we were getting married, people said, well, we said, we don't know how. We just trust God. We have folks say, well, you know, one in every two marriages fail. I said, yes, and that's not going to be ours. We're the other one. We're not the first one. We're the second one. Because we want it to be in a place where we say, God, even if it looks impossible, even if we both have parents that went through divorces, even if statistics say the odds are against us, our inability is your opportunity. Use us for your glory and make us examples of what you can do so that when I stand here now 35 years later, I'm not preaching about what I thought he can do. I'm not preaching about what I heard he can do. I'm preaching about what he's already done. Ah. Woo. Hey, nobody has to tell me that God is able. I've seen him work. Nobody has to tell me that God will show up when you come. I've seen him show up. Nobody has to tell me that God can make a way out of nowhere. He's already made a way out of nowhere. Woo! He wants you to walk in that victory. He wants you to see it for yourself. Thank God for grandmama's testimony, but he wants you to have it. Would you stand on your feet this morning? I want to pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you, God. God, no matter where we are on our journey today, God, each of us has enemies. Some are tangible. Sometimes they're people. And things that come up against us and other times are intangible. Depression and anxiety. Sickness and disease, God. Fear and insecurity. But God, no matter what the enemy is, God, they lead us back to trusting you. And they remind us, God, that we can only look to you for victory. Father, I ask that for each of us here today, that we would be positioned In such a way that what we profess about you, we'll walk it out in practice. That you can show up on our behalf and give us victory on our journey. I pray for the one here this morning that is discouraged, 
about things that have happened on their journey, may they know, God, that this is not the end of the story. But you've allowed them to hear this message today because you want to meet them on their journey. And you want to get them where they're called to be, God, and make straight their way, Father God. And Father, we pray just that today, Lord, that our way would be straight wherever we're going from, from here to there. Make our way straight. Keep us in all of our ways, and we will glorify you and honor you for it. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.